Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, as usual, and today we're discussing very important topic, dawah to non-Muslims. Dr. Zakir, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakir, it's a topic that you and I love very much together. And I know that, of course, you are an authority in the world about it. Alhamdulillah, by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I prefer calling myself a student <laughs> of Inshallah. Islam and Compassion Religion. I know a lot of the viewers would consider you to be an authority on the topic, Dawah to non-Muslims. And I think that's why it's an incredibly important show that we're going to start today. I'd like to ask you the first question, which is first and foremost in any scientific analysis of any topic, which is to define the topic, define the term Dawah, and to, from our last show on Islah, how does that differ from Dawah? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmeen. Amma baad. Awuz billahi minish shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuhli sadri. Wa yasilli amri. Wahlul ugdat min lisani yafqaf kawli. As far as the word Dawah is concerned, when anyone Here's the word Dawat, especially the people from the subcontinent, India and Pakistan. The moment they hear the word Dawat, immediately they start thinking of mutton biryani or chicken biryani. They start thinking of a lunch party. Dawat does not mean a lunch party. Dawa or Dawat means an invitation. And today, we will not be discussing about an invitation to a lunch party or dinner party, we are discussing about Dawat al-Islam, the invitation to Islam. And an invitation can only be given to an outsider. So Dawah, that's the reason, can be only done to a non-Muslim. When we give information about Islam to a non-Muslim, inviting him towards Islam, the Arabic word used is Dawah. And the meaning of the Arabic word Islam is to repair. It means to improve. So when we speak about Islam to a Muslim, giving him more information about Islam, the more appropriate word is Islam. Though both these words are interchangeable, but if you want to use specifically, the word Islam is used when we speak about Islam to a Muslim, giving him more information. And Dawa is a word used when we speak about Islam to a non-Muslim, inviting him towards the fold of Islam. Okay. Right, thank you for that definition. That's a very good start, inshallah. Is dawah, that of, as you said, inviting non-Muslims, is it compulsory? Is it a sunnah? Or what is it? As far as dawah is concerned, for a Muslim, it is a fard. It's compulsory. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor. He's calling us khaira ummah. There is no honor without responsibility. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. For example, in a school, a principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. Similarly, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. 
A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us Muslims and calling us a khaira ummah, the best of people. Don't you think we have responsibility? The reply is given the same verse. Allah says, because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. The reason Allah is calling us khaira ummah is because we enjoin what is right and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is right and do not forbid what is wrong, that is to dawah, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It is a fard. It is compulsory that every Muslim should do dawah. And there are umpteen number of verses in the Quran and several say hadith which prove that dawah is fard. Time doesn't permit us to give a talk. And I've given the talk on this subject, dawah destruction in detail. I'll just mention one more surah of the Quran. Allah says in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, Inna al-insana lafi khusr, illa al-lazin amunu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. Which means, by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. Except those who have faith, those who do righteous deeds, and those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. This Surah Al-Asr, according to Imam Shafi, he said that if this Surah was revealed, it was sufficient as a guidance to the whole of humanity. And it is also called as Rahe Nijad, the path to salvation. For any human being to go to Jannah, he has to fulfill four criteria. Number one is Iman. Number two is Amal Salihat, that is righteous deeds. Number three is Watawasob al Haq, inviting people to truth, that is Dawah. And Watawasob al Sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four criteria, if they're missing, under normal circumstances, that human being will not go to Jannah. He may be a very good Muslim. He may be offering five times salah, he may be giving zakat, he may have gone for hajj. But if a Muslim does not do dawah, according to Surah Al-Asr, he shall not under Jannah. Under normal circumstances. If Allah wants to forgive and then put you in Jannah, that is Allah's prerogative. Because Allah says in the Quran, as we discussed in the last episode, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, and in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116, that if Allah pleases, he may forgive anything. But the sin of shirk will not forgive. For a person who has committed shirk has strayed away far. So if Allah wants to forgive you if you don't do dawa and then put you in Jannah, that's Allah's prerogative. But under normal circumstances, doing dawa is fard for any human being to go to Jannah. Not only dawa is required, all four are required. Iman, only dawa will not take you to Jannah. All four are required. Iman, righteous deeds, watawasabil haq, that's dawa, and watawasabil sabr inviting people to patience and constancy. Therefore, dawa is fard on every Muslim. I think that's very clear. Now, leading on from the definitions of the terms and the fact that we know it's now compulsory upon us, what are the best methods during these testing times, let's say, for Muslims? I mean, I don't know if there's any more or less testing than it was 100 years ago, to be honest, but because I wasn't alive then. But I think that we need to know during this particular time with these particular attacks on Islam that you see prevalent in the media, what are the best methods that we can utilize in order to give dawah to non-Muslims? There are many strategies and various methodologies that can be used for doing dawah. Some are less effective while the others are more effective. The most common method used is that whenever a Muslim meets a non-Muslim, he speaks a hundred good things about Islam. Even if the non-Muslim agrees with the hundred points that have been mentioned to him regarding Islam, yet he will have a few negative points at the back of his mind. He will say, ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. You are the same Muslim who marries more than one woman. Oh, you are the people who subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. That's the reason, whenever I meet a non-Muslim, I ask him up front, ask him the first question, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. 
he can criticize Islam, he can attack Islam, he can criticize the Quran and I make him comfortable that he can ask any question. What does he feel is wrong with the religion of Islam? And after I make him comfortable, he poses about four or five questions. And more than past 15 years that I've been in the field of Dawah, I have realized that there are about 20 most common questions that are asked by the non-Muslims. And when we post to a non-Muslim, what does he feel is wrong with Islam? He asks four or five questions and invariably it falls amongst these 20 most common questions. Now, how have these 20 most common questions come about? They have come about in the mind of the non-Muslim depending upon how the media portrays Islam. Today we have on the international media, in the international newspapers, international magazines, international radio broadcast stations, international satellite channels, we find that there is virulent propaganda about Islam. They are bombarding misinformation about Islam. So depending upon how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions arise in the mind of a non-Muslim. A couple of decades earlier, these 20 questions were different. Maybe a couple of decades later, these 20 common questions will change. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, these questions arise in the mind of a non-Muslim. And I always say that if every Muslim knows the logical reason and the scientific reason regarding the answers to these questions with the quotation from Quran, Hadith and other religious scriptures, even if he cannot convert the non-Muslim, at least he can neutralize the animosity which is there in the mind of the non-Muslim. It will be the best tool. And I've written a book on this topic, Answers to Most Common Questions are by Non-Muslims. And if a person memorizes this, inshallah, he will be able to remove the animosity from the mind of the non-Muslims regarding Islam. Inshallah. That's excellent. And uh, may it continue to be a benefit, all of this knowledge which uh, you've, uh, alhamdulillah, been able to move forward in the field of Dawah, inshallah. According to your knowledge of the subject, Dawah, what is the most important verse in the Quran which gives instructions about passing the message of Islam to non-Muslims? As I mentioned earlier, there are hundreds of verses in the Quran which speak about Dawah. Many verses give them a theology. But according to me, the master key for doing Dawah to the non-Muslim is Surah Al-Imran. Chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Kul yahil al kitab. Say, O people of the book, Talo ila kalmitin sawa im bainano bainakum. Come to common terms as with us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala nushrika bihi shayyum. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yatta khiza baadun abadun arababun minun illah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallu. If then they turn back. Fakul shadu. Say, ee bear witness. We are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this verse of the Quran, though it's addressed to the Ahli Kitab, it can be used for any non-Muslim. It says, Ta'alaw ila kalmitin sawa im bainano bainakum. Come to common terms as bin us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na abudha illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So the most important thing that we have to speak to the non-Muslim is about the concept of Tawheed, concept of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can start the topic by asking him that what does he feel is wrong with Islam and what things that interest him. But your main focus should be you have to come to the main point of avoiding shirk and believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tawheed. Unless you don't come to Tawheed, your da'wah will be useless. You can start with other things, scientific aspects and other things that interest him, literature, maybe history. But unless you do not prove to him about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your da'wah will be useless. You have to prevent him from doing shirk. Therefore, I call this verse of the Quran as the master key for da'wah. Otherwise, there are many other verses, including Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, he says, Udu wal ma'azit al hasna, ahsan. Invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. So Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when you do dawah, you have to do with hikmah and husna in ways that are best and most gracious.
for that answer. Furthermore, how can you give Dawa to a Christian and prove to him that the, the term Tawheed or the oneness of Allah, as I understand it, um, is the correct way for him or her to follow? هذا تربيه في يوز دماستكي سلان امران شابتر 364 تعالوا الى قلمه سواء بيننا وبينكم come to common terms as been assigned you which is the first term Allah na'budu illa Allah that we worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when I will meet a Christian I'll tell him that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ peace be upon him no Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. The Muslim and the Christian, we are going together. But one may ask, where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that most of the Christians, they believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was almighty God and he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or why he says worship me. I would like to repeat. There is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, Verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, was a Muslim. And further mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, Verse number 22. Even of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, when he was asked that which is the first of the commandments, he repeated verbatim what was said earlier by Moses, peace be upon him, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, and he says, Shama Israelo, Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Okay, mashallah. Jazakallah khair for the answer. And what of giving dawah to one of our Hindu brothers and sisters? As far as dawah to Hindus are concerned, again the same master key. Surah Imran, Chapter 3, verse number 64. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na abda illallah. That you worship none but one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we ask any Hindu, any common Hindu, how many gods do you believe in? Some will say three, some will say hundred, some will say thousand, while others will say 33 crores, 330 million. But when we ask this question to a learned Hindu who is well versed with his religious scriptures, he will say that a Hindu should believe and worship only one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in the philosophy of pantheism. Pantheism means the common Hindu believes that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims believe that Everything is God's, G-O-D with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the tree belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Muslims and the Hindus is 
the common Hindu believes that everything is God. What we Muslims believe is everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. So major difference is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? Talo ila kalmitin sawa im bainan bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. When we read the religious scriptures of the Hindus, it's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Swetha Svetara Upanishad. Chapter number six, verse number nine. Na chasti kasaj, janitana chadipa. Of him, there are no lords. He has got no parents. Almighty God has got no superior. He has got no mother. He has got no father. It's mentioned in the Swetha Svetara Upanishad. Chapter number four, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means Almighty God has got no images. He has got no photograph. He has got no sculpture. He has got no painting. Almighty God is without any pratima. And the most common book read by the Hindus is Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. That means those are materialistic people, they worship demigods. In some of the commentaries, it says idol worship. And amongst all the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred, the most authentic are the Vedas. There are four Vedas, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Samved and Atharva Veda. It's mentioned in Ajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasi pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima, as I mentioned earlier, means Almighty God has got no images. He has got no sculptures. He has got no photograph. He has got no painting. All these do not belong to Almighty God. And it's mentioned in Ajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8. Almighty God is imageless and pure. It's mentioned in Ajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pavishanti. Ya asambhuti mupaste. Andhatma, Sanskrit word, meaning darkness. Pravishanti means entering. It means they are entering darkness, those who worship the asambhuti. Asambhuti means the natural things like fire, water, air. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those that worship the asambhuti. Here, asambhuti means the created things like table, chair, idol, etc. So the verse says, those who worship the natural things like fire, water, air, they are entering darkness. They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the created things. And amongst the Vedas, the other Veda is Atharva Ved. It's mentioned Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 58, verse number 3. Dev Maha Asli, verily great is Almighty God. And amongst all the Vedas, the most authentic, most sacred is the Rig Veda. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 164, verse number 46. Ekkam sati vipra bahuda vedante. Truth is one, God is one, but sages call him by a variety of names. That means there are various attributes given to Almighty God. And in Rig Ved alone, in book number two, hymn number one, there are no less than 33 attributes given to Almighty God. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number eight, hymn number one, verse number one, March Dinadi Sansad. Worship him alone, the one true God. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number six, hymn number 46, verse number 16. Ya ek it mushtihi. There's only one God. Praise him alone. And the Brahma Sutra of Hindu Vedanta is ekkam Braham Devta Naste. Nena Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan eki hai. Dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai, nahi hai, zarabi nahi hai. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all. Not at all, not in the least bit. So in this way, by doing comparative study, coming to common terms, we can convince a Hindu from his scriptures that they should only believe in one God, that's Tawheed, and get him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for more details, I've given a talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And I've proved the various similarities 
about various aspects and that way you can based on the verse of the Quran come to common terms as been asked in you. I just spoke about the major term, the most important that is Tawheed. Well, Dr. Zakir, it's almost difficult to believe that Hindus are not worshipping Allah alongside us. It really is. From what you've just said, SubhanAllah, I don't know how many verses you quoted there, but it's unbelievable. I'm sure there is many more uh, indications within Hundreds. the Vedas and the the Gita, etc., that we can draw upon and help our brothers and sisters in humanity to come back to the right religion of the fitra of Al-Islam, insha'Allah. Jazakallah khair. Dr. Zaki, what is the second most important aspect of Islam that we should convey to the non-Muslims when giving dawah? After Tawheed, the second most important aspect of Islam is Risalat talking about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The moment you prove to him about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our shahada is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, there's no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the messenger of Allah. So after you convince him about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take him away from shirk and idol worship, then you have to prove to him about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I've given the talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various religious scriptures. Time will not permit us to speak in detail. I'll just give a few references, not mention the quote, just the references. How to prove to the Jews and the Christians about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you read the Old Testament, the prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned in the Old Testament. I'll just give the references. Details you can go to our website, irf.net. The prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. The name of Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in the Old Testament in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. He is also prophesied in the New Testament. There are many, I'll just mention the main ones. Prophet Muhammad is prophesied in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. And there are many prophecies. That's what the Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157. They follow the unlettered prophet who is mentioned in the scripture, in the law and the gospel. And Allah also says in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, he said to the Bani Israel, I am sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a messenger to the Bani Israel, confirming the law that came before me and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come whose name shall be Ahmad. And we know Ahmad, peace be upon him, was another name of Muhammad. Regarding how to convince the Hindus, which are the third largest religious people in the world, Hinduism, in numbers, first is Christianity, second is Islam, third is Hinduism. In following, but naturally, is Islam number one. Again, if you read the Hindu scriptures, there are hundreds of verses in various different Hindu scriptures which speak about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'll just mention the main important one. I'll just give references. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhya 3, Shokas 5 to 7. He's also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhya 3, Shokas 10 to 27. He's prophesied in the Kuntap Sukta, which is Atharva Ved, Book number 20, hymn number 127, verse number 1 to 14. He is prophesied in the Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6, as well as the Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7. He is also prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 53, verse number 9. And you can go on and on giving references. One important prophecy is the prophecy of Kalki Autar, which is in the Kalki Purana. Chapter number 2, verse number 5, verse number 7, verse number 9, verse number 11, verse number 15. And it gives details about the name of the father of Prophet Muhammad. It is mentioned as Vishnu Yash. If you translate it as servant of God, that is Abdullah, which is the name of the father of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His mother's name is given as Amina. That is one who is peaceful. It is mentioned he will be born in a city of peace, talking about Makkah. He'll be born in the home of the person who's the chief of that city, that is the family of Quraysh. 
he left four close companions talking about the Khulfa Rashidin. And on and on that angel will help in the battlefield. The full talk I've given Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures alone. So this was in short how you can convince, then you can convince the Buddhists that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned the Buddhist scriptures, in the Parsi scriptures, and the other scriptures of the world. The first is Tawheed, number two is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah, lots and lots of information obviously in that answer. And uh, I think later on in the month, we'll be uh, dealing with uh, some of the other religions. As you've already mentioned, we're going to be dealing with Christianity and then Hinduism and the other religions. How best to convince our brothers and sisters in humanity, regardless of race, color, culture, creed, actually, how to come back to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for them and guide them all, inshallah. You've already mentioned chapter number three, verse 64 regarding that being the key stone or the cornerstone for giving dawah to non-Muslims. How can we use this verse to give dawah to the atheist? As the verse of Sulaiman Imran says, Ta'ala wila qalmitin sawa ibbayna baynakum. Come to come in terms as between us and you, which is the first term, Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. How can we use this master key for atheist? If it's the master key, it should be applicable to all the non-Muslims, irrespective whether he believes in a religion, believes in a God or not. How can you do dawah with this verse to an atheist? The first thing I'll do when I meet an atheist is I will congratulate him. You may wonder that why am I congratulating an atheist? The reason is because most of the human beings, they are doing blind belief. They are following their fathers and forefathers blindly. He's a Christian, my father is a Christian. He's a Hindu, my father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslims because father is Muslim. Here, this atheist is thinking. His father may be coming from a religious background, but he says he does not believe in such a God who is weak, who feels hungry, who can be killed. So, he does not believe in God. The reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is Illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. For the other non-Muslims, I have a double job. First, I have to prove to them the God they're worshipping is wrong. And then, I have to prove to them about the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He already has said there is no God, la ilaha. So he already said the first part of the Islamic creed, Islamic shahada, la ilaha. So half my job is done. The only thing I have to do is the second half, that illa Allah. And then after that, Muhammad Rasulullah, that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is the messenger. And I have given the talk on, is the Quran God's word? And in this lecture, I have showed various ways how you could convince to an atheist about the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Time will not permit us to go into the details, but you can prove to him scientifically. I'll just mention a couple of points. But if you ask an atheist and show him an equipment, which no one in the world has seen, and ask him that who is the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment. After thinking, he will tell you that the creator. Some atheists may say the manufacturer. Some may say the inventor. Some may say the maker. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Just keep this at the back of your mind. Then I ask the question to an atheist. The atheists are people who believe in science. They don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I ask the atheist, how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell me that a couple of decades earlier, a few decades earlier, there were a couple of scientists who described how did the universe come into existence, and they called it the Big Bang. First there was the primary nebula, then there was the secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies, which gave rise to stars, sun, and the earth on which we live. When we ask him, when did you come to know this? He will say 30 years back, 40 years back. So I will tell him, that what you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran more than 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arada. Kaanat ratkan ftakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This, for you're talking about the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this? We will say, okay, maybe it's a fluke. No problem, don't argue. We ask the next question. That what is the shape of the earth in which we live. So he will tell me that it's spherical. When did you come to know about this? 
he will tell, just yesterday in science, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, he will tell the first person who discovered the world was spherical was the person when he sailed around the earth in 1579. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Well, ard the baad is halika dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dhaha, one of its meanings expands. The other is an X shape. And we know today that the world is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical in shape. It is sun from the pole. And the word dhaha does not refer to a normal egg. It refers to the egg of an ostrich, which too is geospherical in shape. Imagine the Quran mentions about the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. When we ask who could have mentioned this, atheists will say, oh, maybe your Prophet Muhammad was a very intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Ask me the next question. The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell me that previously we thought the light of the moon was its own light. It is recently we have come to know, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, that the light of the moon, if not its own light, it's a reflected light. Then we can tell him that Quran mentions 14 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that the light of the moon is borrowed light. It is described as Nur or Munir. It's a reflection of light. Who could have mentioned this 14 years ago? And so on and so forth. You can talk about biology, about embryology, about genetics, about geology, about water cycle, on and on. There are more than a thousand verses of the Quran which speak about science. And every time you mention a scientific fact, you ask him the question, who could have mentioned this 14 years ago? He'll come back to the original answer, the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this inventor, we call him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with the help of science and the glorious Quran, we can prove to the atheists the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Very convincing answers there indeed. And uh, we need to learn how to uh, really have the courage and tenacity to go out there and speak those uh, scientific proofs from the Quran, inshallah. So, Doctor, there must be some other important aspects that we need to pass on to non-Muslims. Could you tell us a little bit more about those? These two are the most important aspects, which no one will dispute. Number one, Tawheed. Number two is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There may be different opinion, which is the third, which is the fourth, which is the fifth. The third is life after death, about salvation. Then you can talk about Salah. You can talk about Zakat. You can talk about Ramadan, fasting. You can talk about Hajj. In short, when we speak to non-Muslim, we should first try and find out what interest. If the interest in literature, we talk about literature. If the interest in science, we talk about science. So to begin with, after trying to remove his misconception, we try and find out what interests him. And depending upon what is interest, if he's a scientist, I will talk about Quran and modern science. And try and convince him in the field which he likes. And then come to Tawheed, Isalat, and the other aspects. Inshallah. Zakhallah khair. What are the various means by which dawah can be done with non-Muslims? The various means that today a person can use after science and technology has advanced is one is giving dawah life, one-to-one -one basis, or giving a talk in public. That's a common way. But in terms of using means, we can use the print media. That is, print media is periodical, non-periodical. Non-periodical are booklets, literature, pamphlets. Periodical are magazines, newsletters, whether daily, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, yearly. Besides print media, we have the audio media. We can use audio cassettes and CDs and tats. We can use on the Walkman while walking. You can use in the offices. You can convey the message of Islam by giving lectures on the audio tapes, CDs, etc. It can be used besides on individual level. It can be used in offices, it can be used in gathering, in parties, in functions. It can be used on the radio broadcast stations on a wider scale. The third is the video media, whether it be video cassettes, video tapes, CDs, DVDs. On the larger scale, whether it be the cable TV, whether it be the satellite channels. And the fourth is the internet or the information technology. You know, through the website, through the emails. So these are 
besides the individual dawa and the public lectures, there are four different means of doing dawa. Okay. Zakhalak here once again, Dr. Zakir. What are the various advantages and disadvantages of various means uh, on a path to giving dawa to non-Muslims? Each of these means has advantage and disadvantage. For example, as far as the retention is concerned, today scientific research tells us that when a person reads something, a common human being he retains 10% of what he has read. When a person hears something, he retains approximately 20% of what he has heard. When he sees something that is visual, he retains on average 30% of what he has seen. And if he hears and sees together, that is a video, audiovisual together, videotape or a CD, you know, video CD, on average a human being retains 50%. So in terms of retention, the maximum power is the video, audio video together. Then is only visual. Then comes hearing and the last is only reading. As far as the advantage and disadvantage is concerned, the print media, though the retention is 10%, it is portable. You can carry in the train, carry in the bus, carry in your car, you can carry it anywhere. It's easy for transportation. But at a time, only one person reads it. Or sometimes someone is peeping, maybe one or two, that's it, three. But the reach per thing is limited. One at a time, two at a time, maximum. But it's portable. You can kite anywhere. And it is important, will always remain important. The next is the audio media in which the portability is less as compared to the print media, as compared to the book or the pamphlet. But yet you have Walkman that can be taken. You can hear it in the cassette, in the car, in the Walkman. But at a time, either one can hear it individually, or a group of people can hear it, five, ten. If it's a gathering, a few hundred can hear. On the radio broadcast station, millions can hear. As far as the video media is concerned, again, it's less portable as compared to audio. You know, there are this man that have come out. There are you know, small television screens in the car, in the buses, in the planes. In terms of portability, it is less. But in terms of reach, it is much higher. You know, it can reach cable TV, satellite channel, millions. And last is the internet. Internet, again, individual person has to go on that site. That too, you require an internet connection, you require a computer. It has its own limitation. But many people can access your site. It's easy for anyone to open a website. You don't require any money. It's very cheap. Open it, person can have a website. So you can spread information very easily. It is advantage and disadvantage. Any person who wants to slander, or speak false thing, easily can do it. Otherwise, print media, to print a book requires money. To produce audio cassette or a video cassette takes money. Here, anyone without any finance, he can write anything, any nonsense. So, it has a good disadvantage and advantage. A person who wants to spread Islam also, he can spread it. So, you have to make the right choice between the two. So, these are the various advantages and disadvantages of the media. Inshallah. According to you, what's the most effective means of giving dawah? As I mentioned earlier, each means has advantage and disadvantage. But if you ask me in terms of reach, in terms of cost effectiveness, I would say number one today is the satellite channel. Each one has its advantage, it should continue. I'm not saying the other means should not continue. But in terms of reach, as far as satellite channel is concerned, a person can reach millions of people. Because for a person to come for a public lecture, a non-Muslim, he may feel uncomfortable coming in front of thousands of people. If a person gives a talk, how many people can he gather? Hundred, few hundred, thousand, few thousand, ten thousand, how many? The largest gathering I've addressed is one million people. That's also once in a blue moon. Otherwise, normally hundred thousand people. But on the satellite channel, you can reach millions of people, alhamdulillah. Millions of people. And on estimate, alhamdulillah, now on average, Peace TV is reaching about 70 million viewers at present. And inshallah, I think in this Ramadan is going to increase or going to multiply, inshallah, this Ramadan. The statistics about six months back, you know, that throughout the world, alhamdulillah. Now we're reaching more than 20 countries. So what IRF did in the past 15 years in the field of Dawah that we did, this Peace TV in one year, alhamdulillah, the amount it has reached, the message that has been conveyed is much more than what we did in the past 15 years. So the effectiveness of a satellite channel is much more. And the cost effectiveness, if you calculate, the amount you spend 
and divided with the number of people watching, it is maybe 5% dollar a month. It's less than 2 cent per person a month, which is absolutely cheap. Absolutely. Therefore, it's the most effective one. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir Naik, with this crash course in Dawa. Dawa in the month of Ramadan has been most useful, I'm sure, to the brothers and sisters out there, certainly myself. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Jazakallah khair for listening. Take benefit of all of this information you've been given. And if you join us tomorrow, inshallah, we will be discussing the topic Qadda fasts, Fidya, and Kafara fasts. Please do join us then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي كل من